off. Is that all right? It's half half past four. So this is our last session of the um, of the day. Two papers um, about employee ownership um, coming from really quite different perspectives. So we get a, a sort of very good uh, contrast, and I, I think um, also you know, good good things to um, talk about. So it will be 20, 25 minutes um, for each speaker and then the, rem the remainder of the 40 minutes um, on questions and answers. Um, so it's um, Rory first um, with okay. ontologies of um, employee ownership. Yes, and uh, the observant among you uh, are going to see that, sorry, am I, am I can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, the observant among you uh, will notice that the paper, I've, the title on the screen is different to the title in the programme. Um, and the reason for that is that this paper has just been published in JOD, which is the Journal of the European Research Institute for uh, Cooperative and Social Enterprise Research. Um, and during the peer review process, they said it was more of a comparative analysis than a deconstruction, a reconstruction. So that's the title that we've gone with. Um, so this is co-authored with David Wren, and the starting point for this paper was his PhD work. And then we combined it with the case studies from my own PhD, which is was now um, nearly 20 years ago I started it, um, and some post-PhD studies. So there are 10 cases I'm going to look at. But the, the, the topic is what's the reality? What is the reality of employee ownership? That's what we're trying to do. How, what are the uh, assumptions being made about its nature, which makes it an ontological study? So the first query is why does ontology matter? It's, it's the study of being, it's the study of nature. We can't study anything unless we know the thing that we are seeking to study, unless we can define what it is we're studying, how can we ever make a sample of the organisations or the things that we want to study? Um, so what we're really trying to do is provide some groundwork for future researchers of employee ownership and employee owned businesses. Um, and in the process of doing this, we've reached some um, it's, a, it's sort of a conclusion that takes us back into the 1970s, and I will, I will clarify why that is the case later. There was a way of framing the field in the 1970s that we think is more effective than the way it is being framed now. Um, the strategy that we went through, which I'll, I've got a section on the methodology later, is that we, we, thinking about all of the literature that we've read about employee ownership over the years, we think that there are five key themes, five things about the reality of employee ownership that you need to ask yourself. So we need to become familiar with these five questions in order to design a study of employee ownership. Um, and so I'm going to go through the questions that we've eked out of reading the literature and then I'm going to show the process that we went through to answer those questions in relation to the 10 uh, employee owned businesses that we chose for this paper. Of those 10, there's a selection of trust owned, directly owned and cooperatively owned um, employee owned businesses. And I will explain those terms in due course and what they mean. So the five questions, I'll take go through each of these in terms of the literature support for them. The first one is what realities are the creators of employee owned businesses trying to bring to fruition? So there are different reasons that employee owned businesses come into existence. Um, the second is that that might that only tells us about the um, the way the founders conceive the business. It doesn't tell us about how they recognise who is employed. Yeah. So whenever you start an employee in business, you then have to define well who are the employed who own this business. So there's a debate to be had about who is employed. What do the employed own? So obviously in, in franchising the employed, you choose what it is they get access to, what they gain, what they possess. And then of course, the more interesting questions, I think, are what impact do, do these ownership rights or these gains have on the employed and how does that change the culture of the organization? So these are all big areas of employee ownership as a research field. You could, you could devote a separate paper to each of these, 
but we think that you need to ask this of yourself before you begin a study of employee ownership so that you you bed down what you think uh, employee ownership is all about so starting with the first one motivation um hyman and mason wrote a, a, a quite a good book on on this but they distinguish between ideological and instrumental motivations and i think for us the ideological ones are probably easiest to recognize so there's a oft retold story of John Speed and Lewis falling out with his father because his father paid the family more than they paid the entire workforce um, uh, from a one year of trading back in 1920 something, I think. And similarly, Ernest Bader, who converted a family business because he created the idea of the cooperative Commonwealth, he wanted to pass it through and that was to deal with social injustice or indeed in, in Mondragon, Arismendiaretta's view um, about you know sociological teachings around workers dignity and democracy at work as, as, as a reason for creating an employee-owned business. The instrumental motivations, um, this is something that we kind of got uh, more aware of as we went through peer review, so it's not just you know you might go with employee ownership because you think it's going to lead to greater productivity, so it, it may not be about enfranchising people, it may not be about democracy, it's just about making more money. Yeah? But it can also be rescuing a firm or protecting jobs. There are a number of pragmatic situations. So if you think of an example here, um, the, um, the recovered company movement, I think I've got this later in the presentation, the recovered company movement in Argentina, you know, people were just closing factories. So they had a problem. How do we keep our jobs? How do we how do we live? Um, so they turned to a form of employee ownership to do that. So I think in in the cooperative sector, the idealism is expressed through your commitment to cooperative values and principles. There are obviously ethical and uh, cooperative principles or values that go with the principles. Um, and you also see it expressed in the institutional arrangements in places like Italy and Spain, where there is um, uh, almost like a contractual understanding that you are going to uh, absorb workers that are laid off in other co-ops. That You have to sign up through a contract with the, the bank in Mondragon to do that. And there's a lot of institutional pressure from cooperative bodies for this to happen in Italy as well. So there's the example of the instrumental rationale. Now, what's the reason that this Argentinian example is quite interesting is it, it, it was instrumental to begin with, but it very quickly then became ideological. It became like a beacon for anti-capitalists the world over, um, the story of the recovered companies in Argentina. But for the people on the ground, they were just trying to stay in work. So there's your first question. What realities are the creators trying to bring to fruition? The second one, is how do the founders recognize members and how are the employee-owned businesses recognized in law, particularly tax law? So, um, so there's two sides to this recognition thing, the, from, the, from the inside down to the membership and from the outside down to the institutional form. Now in the UK, there's been uh, quite a few papers on this because of the um, amount of work done on employee ownership in the last decade or two decades in fact it started with uh, business innovation and science is that biz yeah i think so employees have both a voice in how the business is run and a stake in it it's, it's delightfully vague about the form the voice should take and what type of stake there should be um, and of course that gets complicated by uh, the distinction between membership rights and employment rights as employees, you may have some voice rights. You probably won't have any stake rights. In membership, you may have stake rights and voice rights, but they can be aligned or they can be different. So far in the UK, the government will only recognize employee ownership for tax purposes if you form a trust for employee benefit. And that trust is then granted tax benefits and the person who gives their shares to the trust is given a tax benefit as well. But in other places like Spain, self-employment is the norm. In fact, the cooperative laws are clear that the member workers or the worker members of, of a worker co-op are self-employed. And therefore, 
um, there's no trust arrangement uh, like the UK. So the employed could be self-employed, they could be workers as, as, as uh, understood under EU definition of a worker, EU employment law, or they could be employees that hold a contract of employment. There are a range of different statuses for the employed. And of course, how you frame the employed will, will determine whether you recognize something as an employee and business. Further to that, what about specific contractual terms? And I'll come back to that with our findings. Um, there are specific, there might be specific terms in a contract of employment that would grant you membership. So who are the employed is a big, is a big question. So once you know who the employed are, what, what are they granted? Yeah. What access do they have? What, what can they possess as the employee owners? And this could be granted in incorporation documents, employment contracts, and in, indeed service contracts. If you're using self-employment or recognizing self-employment, there may be things in service contracts. Now there's literature here that um, suggests that the ownership rights in an employee owned business extend to three things. A right to possess a share of the, the physical being or the financial value. Uh, the right to exercise or influence uh, the employee owned businesses strategy and business plans and the right to information about the status of, of the business. So the information rights. So the nature of EOBs is to understand how these these gains or things that you can possess have been objectified. Um, how do how are they put into practice uh, within a particular employee and business? What do the employee own? Then we move on to knowledge and information. This is interesting because John Speed and Lewis in, in his, his, he wrote a book called Fairer, Fairer Shares. And knowledge, he, he had a lot to say about information and knowledge. And, 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 and that's the reason they have a free press. That's the reason that managers must answer the questions that are put to them through a publication called the Gazette. Um, and he said, you can't have democracy without information and knowledge. And of course, when we were doing our own studies, we found that these businesses are, they are very forthcoming with information, uh, almost overwhelmingly so. But it, 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 the thing is, this is begins to have, what impact does this knowledge or information have on employee owners? So the, the acquisition of legal rights can change psychologies, attitudes, behavior. If you, if you believe you have the legal right to something, it's going to change your um, attitude and the way that you behave at work. And also does holding shares or membership rights, does the holding of those shares change your attitude or your access to things? Uh, and of course this can be affected by the legal framework. So there could be different legal frameworks for employee and businesses and the range of rights that can be granted might be constrained by the legal form. There's a fan fabulous piece of work by Gates that identifies all of the different rights that might be granted. Um, he wrote a book called The Ownership Solution, which I, I can still recommend even now. So what impact do ownership rights have on the employed is another key question. And then last but not least, power and control. So um, connecting the structural questions to the subject of experience and the culture of employee owners. So again, does it lead to a cultural change? Well, the evidence would be that it does. So for example, the fact that the switch to employee ownership reduces enterprise failure must mean that there's some cultural shift in, in, the, in the way people go about work. Um, Virginia Perrotin examined the longevity and found that labour managed firms have improved survival rates, particularly over the long term, and that the gap between their survival rates compared to investor owned firms increases over time. Um, so that must mean that there, there may be cultural changes that bed down after 10 to 15, 20 years. Yeah. So this is our final question. How's workplace culture? changed by employee ownership rights. And that was, that was David's PhD. That was David's focal question for his PhD. So how do we sample? Yeah, um, we've used um, Mike Ball's work. So Mike, 
he was he was looking specifically at the field of social enterprise, but he argued there are three bodies of law, trust law, uh, company law, and then society law. Uh, and trust law is is largely associated with the, the world of charities. And uh, the, so you talk about trustee board. Direct ownership is the is the norm within the private sector. Uh, people directly own um, rights that are embedded in, in shares. But in co-ops, we have different characteristics of shares. So we have a par value share. Typically, it has voice rights attached to it that are much more forth. There's, there's much more around the voice rights that come with the owning of a cooperative share than necessarily financial or economic rights, although there are some that can be defined as well. Um, so we're, we're looking at these three uh, as our thing. So in, in, in the world of trusts, um, we, we see employee benefit trusts, share trusts, employee ownership trusts are now defined in UK law, and they tend to hold ownership on behalf of employees so actually they can be criticized for preventing employee ownership from some point some people argue that this prevents employee ownership because the ownership is by a legal entity rather than the employees directly um, direct ownership is the, is the reverse of the trust it means that the 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 shares in the business whether they be cooperative shares or company shares are directly owned by the individuals who work there. Uh, and the distinction here is the characteristics of the share. Although I think also you could say that often membership rights are the focus here, whereas property rights are the focus here. We had this by Sonia Novkovich last year, uh, distinguished on that basis too. So moving on to our methodology. So we, 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 we felt we had to take what's called social constructionist philosophy because there's no solid foundation for employee ownership. There's a different legal foundations which are already constructed by conversations in society, by the interactions between different institutions and people. The realities of employee ownership don't exist independently of the members. If, if, you, stop use, if you stop doing the things that your constitution says you should do, um, does that does that mean you're no longer an employee owned business? I think there's an argument to say that you are no longer an employee owned business if you don't do the things that your constitution says in the same way that we say a fake co-op is a co-op that doesn't follow co-op values and principles. The same thing could be argued here. So we the knowledge that we're generating comes from what's called an intersubject of epistemology. It's it's the narratives, the norms that have emerged from the people that we've been studying. It, it's the things that they foreground as, as their reason for being, if, you say, if that makes sense. So 10 cases, I've talked about them. We divided the cases by their preference for trust ownership. So the three cases, T123, three cases uh, uh, where direct ownership is dominant, D1, 2, and 3, and then four cases where cooperative ownership is dominant. Yeah. So these were all, um, constituted as societies rather than companies or trusts. For every case, we tried to answer the five questions and then we compared within each legal framework, the answers we had for the different cases. We then wrote an integrated narrative, a narrative that summarized what we'd found in each legal framework. And then we compared those narratives in order to prepare the paper. So. What, what in the actual paper is the, is the write-up for step four. That's what we're doing. Now, all I can do is, is, is present the final table. There's a, a whole narrative that goes behind um, the things that are going on here. But there are things that are different and there are things that are similar. So self-management, it, it clearly goes across all of the legal forms. And by self-management here, every single um, legal approach to employee ownership seeps, seeks to take labour out of the market. So in other words, labour is no longer treated as a commodity. Um, you're trying to end wage labour in a sense, even though they might pay wages, your, your status is not as a wage labourer. Yeah. Um, there's more emphasis on wealth creation in the directly owned. There's more emphasis on personal freedoms in the cooperatively owned stronger rejection of hierarchy over here as well 
but we found a, a, a satisfaction at work theme within the trust owned uh, business as well. For the second question, who are the employed? The, the tricky thing here is even in, within trust, it's always down to the employment contract. So both permanent and temporary workers could be um, included, but they might exclude other workers. So people who've been brought in from agencies and things may not be uh, treated as employee owners. But in two cases, only permanent employees. Now, you might think that's fair, but there were temporary employees, for example, in T2 who had worked there for five years. And they'd been on temporary employment contracts for five years and were still not treated as, as uh, having the rights of employee owners. The directly owned, the, the interesting thing here was the um, actually having a criterion for membership that it included in any significant labor. The way that it was expressed was over 30 over 30 percent of your time or half your future time was the qualifying contribution of labor for um, membership and then in the cooperatively owned field we've got both self-employed and employed um, so we didn't find so well self-employed is it is implied here yeah so but not here yeah so on what do the employed own um, control of the constitution was big in the trust ownership, so the integrity of the democracy around um, the employees having being the only group that can change the constitution was a big thing, yeah, and and generally no right to the residual assets, and that was that was the case. I've got no rights to residual assets here. Actually, that was true in three of the four cases, but there was one case, C one where they did have a right to uh, um, residual assets. In the directly owned, you're using ordinary shares that may be tradable. There wasn't anything tradable here and there wasn't anything tradable there. Yeah. You might have multiple share types also in direct ownership. And, but even if there were rights to assets, they were pretty limited. Yeah. Okay. What impact do ownership rights have on the employed? Um, a lot of access to, to information and knowledge here. Equal voting power in the changing of governors. In fact, I would say on, on, the, on the question of governors, it was mostly equal voting power, although there was variable voting power in uh, a couple of cases uh, on operational stuff, but not so much on the elections to the board. There was incredibly open access, I would say both here and here, the, 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 the level of openness in some of the directly employee owned businesses was absolutely staggering. Um, I mean, I'm not just talking about daily information, which we put at the top, but actually live information We actually had like screens up on the uh, around the building, which would uh, post the progress of, of, of uh, sales data live, you know, as it's happening. Um, Cooperatively owned, the strongest culture around one person, one, uh, one person, one vote, but you, you would find that in the others as well. The strongest commitment to participatory democracy, the the, probably the strongest powers to challenge authoritarianism as well. And the assessment of managers by workers. That was uh, something different. We didn't actually define find that in either of these cases. Lastly, how has the workplace culture changed by people with EO rights? How am I doing for time? Okay, yeah, I'm nearly done. Um, protective culture, paternalism, which is, is a theme that we've found in the literature before. Um, a, big, a big thing on asset sharing uh, across the membership. Yeah, and you find that over here as well. Not quite so much on the directly owned. Culture of solidarity, but the whole life characteristics, the personal development was stronger here, the whole life culture was stronger here. Yeah. So you'd have to read the paper to get the rich conversation around how we arrived at this table. But what I want to do is just have three conclusions to finish. There was some consistency. So um, if you are a researcher who needs a definition of employee ownership, on the basis of these 10 cases, 
there are only four things that we think um, held across all of the legal types. The first thing was the decommodification of labour to promote self-management. The second thing was that all forms were committed to enfranchising workers through membership principles. Some did it more than others, but they all headed in that direction. Um, I, I think the, the culturally, the commitment to a creating open information systems, that doesn't mean that everything was open, but the direction of change, the direction of thinking was all about opening up information for everybody to have access. So they're open information systems rather than uh, management information systems. And I have to say all to varying levels, active support for workplace democracy. They all had an agenda for improving workplace democracy. Um, and th th if you do need a, a, a working definition for sampling, that might be uh, that might work for you. But the diversity was uh, striking. I mean, you can see that from the table, there are different characteristics in different places, but there were interaction between different employee and businesses in the sample. The diversity contributes to the evolution. So for example, trust two studied trust one, direct one and co-op. So a trust model studying all the other forms of employee ownership before deciding how to set itself up. Uh, one of the direct models studied other direct models and a co-op model and indeed uh, other co-op models that in turn drew from the early examples of the worker cooperative movement. This another direct D2 studied um, a, a co-op while evolving variable voting powers or changing I should say from variable voting powers to one person one vote ecosystem so sorry basically the primary uh, trading organizations there was variable voting but the secondary structures which are the was the bodies that put the, the executive in place these were one person one vote so what we what we're seeing is the evolution of employee ownership norms um, and and uh, cross fertilization uh, uh, between the different legal approaches and types and and, and one legal one set of legal principles being incorporated into another. So that pragmatism leads to a new idealism. That's what we're saying. And that's the process of structuration. We thought we could actually see structuration occurring. And lastly, this is the 1970s again. Employee ownership fails to capture what it purports to describe. Yeah. Some employees were not seen as members some people who are not employees or did not have contracts of employment might be seen as worker owners. Yep. And yet they all get discussed in the literature on employee ownership. In the 1970s, uh, Vanek called, talked about labor managed firms. And we think that labor managed firms is a better fit because sometimes the employees did not own the firm, but they did manage it. And they did have control of it because they had the management rights. Yeah. Um, so it, using the word managed overcomes limitations in ownership and using the term labor overcomes limitations in using the word employee to employ somebody with an employment contract. Um, there are many different contractual ways that you can provide labor uh, and you can set the boundary conditions according to labor contribution. Um, so I think the critical thing is that a, a researcher into this field needs to define how they how they define employment or employed yeah you need to be clear who you are including in the in the in the word employed if you're going to use that language but labor managed firms is another way of looking at it which is more inclusive and more inclusive of worker co-ops that's uh, the the key point so i think that's it over to question and answer now the paper well, thank you yeah, Sorry. papers easily accessible from urixc.eu. Yeah. Thank you very much, Rory. That's um, um, extremely interesting. Um, are there any questions? Um, we've got 10 minutes for questions. Yes. Uh, Richard, hello. Hello. Uh, thank you very much. I only caught the conclusions of that. Um, I'll be honest about that. Um, 
that was really, really helpful because I think it has shone some very useful analytical light on the kind of ideological debates which are had within the worker co-op world about whether trust models are proper co-ops or not. I was interested in your first conclusion about the being, you know, limited characteristics that were consistent across all the forms you studied. Mm. And I just wondered if you'd, if you'd compared the worker co-ops with other forms of co-op and you'd compared the trust owned, the employee benefit trust owned firms with other firms owned by some kind of holding trust but not for employee yeah. benefit would you yeah. have found more commonalities um in that direction than you did between those that all share some element of labor management stroke ownership yeah, i'm not sure um i, I I'm, I'm not sure i mean i i, I can think of an, another example from maureen's phd which would uh where you've got uh, greenwich leisure so greenwich leisure are sort of following trust a trust law model but you've definitely got labor management of of production um yeah i, I mean I'm, I'm just not in a position to compare that i mean I, there are there are some interesting things things to do there because I, I mean I, I once worked for procter and gamble and only when i left did anybody tell me that it was owned by a trust and not and not listed on a stock market and it gets pilloried for being, you know, the same as all these other terrible corporates. But, you know, the guy in HR said, you do realise, you know, that this is this is a different kind of business. Uh, and, I, and I didn't know. Um, it was still cutthroat, though. And I'm still glad to leave. <laughs> um, the, the debates that go on. Um, it's interesting because we had a section in the paper on hybridity um but we were encouraged to remove it and i think there is another paper to be had there because particularly thinking of the kind of work that uh, aaron and and um uh, steve are doing uh, with vme i mean they're not alone in using a combination of direct ownership and trusts and indeed one of one of the ones that we called a trust model did have an element of individual ownership as well but it didn't go as far as as the rights embedded in the trust that that Stephen and Aaron have put into VME co-op. So I think the, the, the question for the future is, you know, particularly when you think what Peter Hunt was saying about demutualization, can you use the combination of trust and direct ownership to protect you even more strongly against demutualization? And my feeling is yes. Um, I can admit to you that one of the cases was John Lewis. And uh, what we found was that it was harder to demutualize John Lewis yeah. than the others because the chairman takes an oath to protect the constitution. And when there was an attempt to demutualize it, he couldn't support it because it would be a breach of his oath. And, 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 the, and the staff had the power to vote him out. There's every six months, they take a vote in John Lewis on, as to whether to keep the chairman on. So they do have that in that one person, one vote uh, strength to get rid of a chairman who wants to demutualize. And the partnership board just threw it out. I mean, in a sense, you could you could draw a parallel with consumer co-ops in the early 19th century, where the pre-Rochdale co-ops had largely operated on collective ownership of shared assets. Mm. And they were then in the hungry 40s, those that those that had survived that long were liquidated because the members simply needed their share of the common reserves. Mm. And the reason that the Rochdale model copied um, that example from Scotland of, you know, dividend on purchases, limited interest on share capital was to give an element of individual benefit and a personal stake while while preserving the one member one vote collective nature of the overall of the overall um, business. Yeah, the um, just don't have anybody else that will carry on chatting until another question comes up. Yeah. Um, There's a couple of questions in yeah. chat. Okay, let's take those then. So, um, so for, from Grant, um, who I don't think can can actually talk. Um, sorry if I missed this. Where are the businesses located, and what size are they? Right. Um, the, the they varied substantially in location and size. Um, there's a list of them in the actual paper, which tells you uh, their geographical basis. Most most of them are in the UK. But there was one that was based in in the uk france america and the far east 
and the other one was an international cooperative group um, which had uh, you know 50 overseas subsidiary organizations um, the there were also groups uh, in the uk so there was one group that was based in sheffield it's it's got seven member businesses but actually the case study that we did originally was just of one of those businesses but as we as we worked with them in the years subsequently we got to know the other businesses as well yeah um, in terms of size anything from about a dozen to uh, 80,000 so very wide range Big. Um, and can this research be applied to consumer user co-ops um, affecting the psychology of communities yeah. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I mean, the, the, the questions around ontology that we have pulled out about the rights granted to employee owners, I suppose you could reframe mm. it, the rights granted to members, and what impact do, does the, do those rights have on, uh, on members? I'm not, I'm not sure you would, the, the fifth of those questions about what impact does it have on, on workplace culture, it would be, it would be much more indirect yeah. Then it would be direct. I mean, I'm supervising um, Jeanette Hurst. Of some of you have heard of Jeanette Hurst. You know, she's looking at you know this, this the psychology of of being a worker cooperator, um, when and how it affects your your attitude to sustainable development. So you know, she's looking at you know the way that the co-op values and principles actually permeate the way people think about sustainability. Um, and of course, they're they're acting on that in the workplace. So it's changing the workplace culture. If it were a consumer co-op, it wouldn't be acting in the workplace in quite the same way. You know, the members won't be in the workplace in quite no. the same way. Yeah. So I think you'd need to adapt the questions for uh, consumer co-ops or or, re or or redevelop the themes. Yeah. Thank you. So there's one more question from Grant, but I'll, I'll go to Ian because you've had your hand up for ages. Ian. Yeah. Right. And we've got like three minutes, sorry. <laughs> right. Um, I, uh, while you were talking, and I was impressed with the depth of the analysis, I, I was thinking the, the emphasis very much is on ownership, which is fair enough because it's employee ownership, own businesses. Mm -hmm. But the mention of Greenwich Le Leisure yeah. uh, took me to a book by Dexter Whitefield, I don't know if you've seen that, published by Spokesman, which yeah. is excoriating about Greenwich Leisure as an institution and about the, the question of privatisation of public uh, uh, services, which, which Greenwich apparently in his terms represents the apogee. So it, it may be great for working at Greenwich Ledger, but its history is, uh, you know, raises some awkward questions. And it, it strikes me that that that's I'd have to reserve judgment. I mean, my 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 knowledge of Greenwich Leisure is is afforded to me by the the case study that Maureen's done in her own PhD, mm. and and and, I, and that's a very different view of, of of Greenwich Leisure takes a real interest in its communities and then its service users. Um, I, I uh, yeah, yeah. I, a, I, that's a better question for Maureen than me. Uh, it may be in the break tomorrow. So, yeah. well, it might, if, if we're short of time, it may be worth looking at Dexter Whitefield's work yeah. uh, and his analysis, which comes at it from a completely different direction. I, I can understand that, but I think there's also um, a different side. I think I saw, um, I saw sort of, um, I saw an organisation trying to keep services and jobs um, in an extremely um, an, an extremely hostile um, environment um, when, when Greenwich um, Leisure was formed. Um, just, it was you know, clarify, Greenwich Leisure is not one of the ten cases that um, are in this paper. No. <laughs> <laughs> and ownership is a, a it, yes, it's it's an employee trust, but it's actually um, it actually works as a charity, so it's not actually ownership. Um, sorry, third question that that Grant put up, um, especially in the larger businesses where oligarchies and bureaucracies present, and would they give skewed results? Um, to, a cert to a certain extent, but, but, but far, far less than would be found in um, comparable 
corporations of the same size. So it's very striking in the literature on, on Mondragon that they, 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 there's a specific section by George Cheney, who's an American um, student of work cooperators, who says, you know, however big, however hierarchical, the, the members of Mondragon will criticize the, the governors, they will criticize the managers openly. And the same is true at John Lewis. Um, John Lewis don't just give you the right to put your questions into the magazine. You've got an alternative route within the governance structure to go and talk to a, 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 what's a, like a member's advocate. Mm -hmm. Now, however ineffective that route might be, there are multiple pathways to make sure that your voice, voice is heard. Um, so I would say it's less hierarchical and deliberately so than, than the uh, other corporations of a similar size, but certainly more hierarchical than smaller, flatter worker cults. Great, thank you ever so much. And, and thank you for a really interesting um, paper, um, which obviously has sparked um, yes. debate. And, it, and it's, it's Creative Commons open access. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, it's freely available. Um, so our, our next paper is, um, is Carl. Um, more practical, I think, less theoretical, but I think it does fit really, um, really neatly together, your, um, your arguments. Um, so again, same same structure. Um, if that's okay, and I'll let you go. You, I can't mm -hmm. see. You started sharing, but I can't see anything. Uh -huh. Screen is frozen. Okay. <sighs> Oh, everybody's frozen. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know what to do here. Um, I haven't got. I can't move anything for. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, yeah, something's happening. Sometimes signing out and in works. <laughs> Not always, but. Oh, I think you've frozen, Carl. Has... Maybe you signed out. Has... Elizabeth, do you have the slides? Oh. Could we oh, share no, them? Carl, for... Carl's back. Is he back? He's yeah. back, but it, I can't, I don't know why. Um, we were just saying that sometimes signing out and signing in again can help resolve. I, I did that, I did that, but... You did. It doesn't yeah, it doesn't seem to work. Um, let me stop participant sharing. Let me just stop sharing so you can reshare. Okay. No, it's not responding. Yeah. Oh no, no, no try again. Nothing is happening. And I don't know why. Um, is there a way to just can we just wondering Elizabeth if we make him a co-host how do we you, you've made us co-hosts recently so he's already yeah he is already a co-host yeah otherwise I wouldn't be able to share up I presume no you can share even if you're not a co-host but oh, right. okay um yeah um the only other thing i can suggest is that if you were to to email email a, a copy of the slides somebody else could present them for you so you could email me the slides and i'll yeah i'm trying to i'm trying to get out of my <laughs> the system but it won't let me out either of the system so i don't know why So I'll, I'll let you go, Carl. C Carl, you're muted. Now can you got me? Yep. <laughs> So let me go back one slide. Uh, 
so my topic uh, leading on from Rory is again employee ownership um, uh, in relation to the succession issue for SMEs. Um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, I'm somebody from industry, from the furniture industry, and um, I've been working for a number of years on um, owners and families in particular that are looking to retire and examining various options with them. And um, I saw many companies disappear. So um, what I wanted to do was to uh, take uh, different employee ownership models. Um, so you can see I'm looking at the US, the UK and France and to compare the survival rates when they converted to various models of employee ownership, okay? Um, so there you've got um, a little bit about me. So even though I was uh, originally born in the UK, I've lived in mainland Europe for more or less 34 years now. Um, I'm still a trustee of cooperative and community finance, which I'm sure some of you know. Um, and most of my working life has been spent between uh, teaching, um, restructuring and uh, making sure that SMEs survive. So that's very important for me is that legacy of um, SMEs and of course related to the furniture industry and seeing how I could transition some of those companies to employee ownership. So that's basically a little bit of what I do. And then I was asked um, via the school that you can see that I'm part of and you can see it behind my, my head. Um, which is a small uh, international management school based in Lille in France and part of the Catholic University um, of Lille. Uh, and in all of my courses, because we, we, we spoke yesterday as well about business schools and I thought that was interested and I'm probably um, only one of the professors to um, include analysis of cooperatives um, in all of my classes from a strategic point of view, but also a finance point of view. So finance and non-financial variables. Um, and also something which is um, a, a pretty hot topic um, over in Europe, which is entrepreneurship through acquisition, where you can actually buy existing companies rather than starting up by yourself. So um, just to, to make it fun, because I'm, I'm the last person to speak today, so I've got to keep you on your, on your toes. That's why I on purpose, I sabotaged my own my own presentation so we could keep the thing going. Um, you, you, I've got a couple of photos in each slide so you can imagine it. So uh, the, the industry is SME furniture manufacturing in those three countries. The context is, you know, the succession issue. So we're looking to retire. Um, I didn't look at companies that were distressed or in difficult situation or they wanted to sell out for another reason. And um, the, the solution that I was looking at was conversion to employee ownership, okay? Um, obviously, I'd, I'd done uh, uh, quite an extensive literary review and some of the, the names that were mentioned in Rory's presentation also uh, came up in my uh, bibliography. Uh, and of course, it's, it's a topic which has been around for a number of years, um, all this notion of baby boomers retiring, um, um, having made, you know, su having successful lives, built up successful businesses um, and, and kids no longer wanting to probably take over as they did in previous generations. And we've also got to remember that furniture industry is quite fragmented industry. OK, so there are not many very big key players on the market and not that many listed companies. So we're talking more or less small firms. So I, I um, in my analysis, I looked at firms, I think the, the, the largest one was in the US with, with probably 120, 130 employees, okay? So we're looking at quite um, uh, small um, organizations. Um, based on, obviously, uh, real uh, conversions that took place, but I've had to anonymize those for, for purposes of spreading out and... Uh, you know what it what it's like and in my um methodology my the approach i took i i interviewed um six expert practitioners so um took a couple from the uk a couple from the us i spoke to deb oxley i spoke to um uh, james wright at co-ops uk policy advisor glenn bowen in wales um but also um over in the united states where um they're a little bit more advanced in terms of innovative financing uh, when you want to convert a company to employee ownership. Um, so you've probably a couple of names, Cutting Edge Capital, um, you've probably heard of them. Um, 
um, and also um, obviously because I was studying in France, um, looked at a couple of uh, and spoke to a couple of people working in the the SCOP network, which is the equivalent of worker cooperatives, as we know, but very, very, very uh, widespread in France. So conversions, those are the years they took place. And then I, I followed them over a five year period um, because I, I'd done some analysis and it was seen that m a, quite a few when they when they convert or are taken over disappear after three years. So I thought I'd go for a longer period to be able to analyze that they're still around and surviving. Um, so I, 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 I analyzed and went back five year period afterwards to see how they were moving on. So it was quite simple. I took an ESOP in the US, um, EOT in the UK, because I couldn't find a cooperative in the furniture industry um, or wasn't aware of one at that time. Maybe the situation has changed at the moment. Um, I think there's a couple more come on in the US um, since the, the uh, um, I started my analysis. And um, there have been quite a few, uh, on the other hand, conversions to um, co-ops or what they call SCOPs um, in France, okay? Um, so you've got an idea of the product ranges there, so you 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 can imagine what what the type of um, you know um, furniture that they're manufacturing. Um, the first thing was to um, obtain uh, some sort of validity. So I, I wanted to get access to companies that had already converted or were considering converting, and um, I wanted to be able to uh, use the data. Um, in the end, to be able to say, well, look, conversion to uh, employee ownership is a valid business model. Um, I came up uh, during my uh, of this whole period uh, with a lot of, um, I wouldn't say criticism, but a lot of, a lot of strange looks uh, from people uh, in the professions. Um, we mentioned it yesterday, um, accountants unaware of uh, models of, of, you know, conversion to employee ownership. Um, um, business owners unaware or unwilling to accept it um, as a valid model uh, and having to fight a lot for them to, uh, you know, to see that. Particularly, um, furniture industry is a, a little bit secretive and um, it's not easy to get information. Unfortunately, I've got a network spanning, you know, several countries to get the real data. I didn't want to use, you know, um, sort of simulations of things. Um, in order to then say, well, look, if it works in the furniture industry, um, probably it could be successful in any type of manufacturing. Um, I'm not somebody who looks at services. I have worked in my professional life and there's been conversions with dental practices, um, interior designers, um, architects offices, um, but I'm more of somebody who's um, <laughs> in the manufacturing side. So I, I wanted to concentrate on that because that's, you know, what, I, what I'm more knowledgeable about. And um, the, the, the second objective was purely here to analyze the financial performance. So before and after. And I focused on five key vi financial variables. And I know some of you out there are going to probably throw stones at me because you say, yeah, Carl, um, we can't do that on a cooperative and how dare you take those things. Um, but for me, it was important to treat them as a business and therefore analyze them as a business, realizing that they were a cooperative, an EOT and an ESOP. Um, but I didn't want to focus on non-financials. I just wanted to focus on the financials. And that's the, 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 the I'm going to share with you later. Um, what I'm going to be looking at in, in future research. So I, I took those five, uh, which are five, I think, common uh, ratios for analyzing businesses. That's what I've done um, for, for a, a best part of my career um, based on due diligence, based on, you know, companies for sale, uh, furniture manufacturers, at least for sale. Um, you could argue that for services and other types of businesses, we can use other ratios and then I fully agree with that, fully agree. Um, so um, I've made a summary of the findings because obviously I'm not gonna show you all the Excel files and all, all the things, um, just with a few diagrams there. I'm sure everybody out there is aware of the SCOP system and a little bit how it operates in, in France. Um, and one of the other um, elements which was important to me is that um, in many European countries, there's a lot of funding, European funding, regional funding um, for um, anybody who wants to start a cooperative. 
Okay, there's probably more money than there are projects. However, it becomes very difficult, and that's what we saw um, when you try to convert an existing business, because it becomes a little bit difficult for banks because they don't understand what work employee ownership is all about. Um, it's very difficult for all the funders, particularly in France. I mean, ESOPs and EOTs, we're clear on that. There's, there will be funding, and part of it could probably be financed by um, um, those that are intending to retire and the current owners of the business. There's always solutions which could be found. In France, it's a little bit more complicated because, you know, if you go for a cooperative, do you want the owners to stay around? Do they want to be part of that cooperative? You know, is there a need for them? Do I need to start afresh? So, Again, um, all of those questions uh, come into, um, you know, in, into action. I intend to move further on those. Basically, this is what um, I came up with. So um, I took those ratios. Um, obviously, different accounting uh, principles. We've got the US, we've got the UK, and we've got France in there. One a cooperative, the other two more of, you know, direct or, or hybrid versions of employee ownership. And then I compared with the global furniture industry average in 2018. And um, you can see they're quite interesting, some of the percentage changes, which are quite, quite huge uh, in some of those cases. And even on myself, I was, I was thinking, well, uh, you know, obviously, um, this is just three examples. And unfortunately, I didn't find any more. I could have gone to other countries but that would have just made the process a little bit longer. And it made life easier for me because I can speak several languages to obtain information in languages that I can understand. Otherwise, you've got to translate things, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the plan is to, to move forward and try and push and get a, a sample, which is much bigger, uh, because with three cases, OK, yeah, I can say it works. Uh, but you're going to say to me, yeah, Carl, that, that's not really representative. And I, and I understand that. So I'm... Um, I, I don't know. I think you had 10, right, Rory? 10 cases. So, um, yeah. I, I, you know, three is fine and they're all looking pretty positive and pretty good. The work of the cooperative were a little bit down, but we would expect that because there's going to be more, you know, money set aside for other things rather than, you know, looking for returns on assets and returns on equity. So I think that's, you know, that can explain it. Um, obviously, there's a reluctance to want to take on any extra debt. Um, the only worrying thing there for me was the interest coverage that if they were to uh, borrow for whatever reason moving forward, that would be complicated. Um, and operating mortgage in the, in the three uh, cases were below the industry average, but then I'm comparing globally everybody, including, you know, um, listed companies, that's what the average figures came out with. But I still think fairly respectable for a small and medium sized firm. So um, um, that, that's, uh, that's what I set out to prove a little bit. Um, and obviously, I realize there's limitations on the number of examples. Um, and of course, I can go further on the data, but I initially just wanted to concentrate on the financials. And of course, I only as well took cases where there was an issue of succession, okay, to avoid those uh, SMEs disappearing. Um, I didn't want to look at distressed cases because obviously that would have given me completely different results in, in, in the ratios or for those that just wanted to sell out because they were fed up with the industry and decided that they wanted to just to move on to something else, what we call a lifestyle change, I presume. Um, the recommendation that um, I, I, I put forward was pretty much based on my conversations and interviews with um, the US in terms of innovation, and I'm sure you're aware of uh, Evergreen Cooperatives and an organization called Permanent Equity. Evergreen, unfortunately, haven't moved that further. It was quite inspiring at the beginning, but it seems to be a little bit of, it's, it's fairly dropped fairly flat, and I, I can't find out the reasons why. Um, there are many other organizations that invest, and the I idea was to think about um, non-extractive patient capital fund. Um, that was what we were um, thinking about um, together with the uh, various furniture associations that had asked me a little bit to look into this matter, um, that would actually purchase the funds because it was complicated in some European countries. If, if you wanted to sell to the employees, 
or you wanted to convert completely to employee ownership. So we had to look for some sort of model that say, well, look, we'll step in, we'll buy it, and then you can you can sort of you know convert gradually. And that was a little bit the the idea behind all of that. And um, in fact, um, we can go to reality today. I don't know if you're aware of that. There's a fund which is based jointly in the UK and Gibraltar, which is called Valoop. Um, I've put you the website there. And it's, um, it's an organization which is in line. Um, some of you will say, oh, Carl, that's, that smells of private equity. And that's not my intention to, to smell of private equity or anything like that. Um, the model is based a little bit um, on the private equity, but there's more of a, a social notion behind it. Of, of, uh, and that's important for me. It's saving those businesses, saving those jobs, uh, ensuring that companies stay in local communities in regions. Um, for the simple reason I've had to battle a lot in my life, particularly in France and Spain, um, not only against strategic buyers and, 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 and private equity, um, but also um, many, many uh, employees see employee ownership um, as a way of saving the company that it's not sort of transferred uh, somewhere else. And that's, that's a big argument over here. So there's a lot of push for employee ownership. Um, and even the owners realize that because some of them are very attached to those local communities and regions, families which have been around, their names over the door. So they've, they've got a little bit of a reputation to, to, to keep as well. And they, they sponsor a lot of activities. And when I speak to them about that, they say, well, Carl, yeah, um, you're right. Um, if I sell it to the bigger competitor or to somebody else or um, whoever, um, it's probably going to be closed down in a couple of years and the activity will be transferred everywhere else. And th that's been uh, one of my keystone battles over the last couple of years is to protect those jobs. And, and if I can push employee ownership, um, that's a little bit, you know, that's on my, 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 my battle scorecard. Um, and so just a, a few concluding remarks is that I, I'm happy um, obviously, I'm in favor of cooperatives. Uh, you, you can see that, and I don't have to preach this to you. I have to preach it to the outside world, um, professional services, um, wherever I can get my foot in the door in the European Union to push for a little bit more. Um, but particularly businesses themselves, because they're unaware. And of course, you can't go knocking on the door of every single SME. So I go via the federations, um, trade unions, um, associations, all of those who would obviously relate to the jobs and the social aspects rather than purely the um, financial uh, aspects of a deal. But in whatever, whatever I try to do is to ensure that, you know, for all stakeholders, that there's a fair deal on the table. If people want to leave and they're prepared to, you know, sell it on to the management team and the, and the employees, that everybody, you know, it's a win-win for everybody. That's um, uh, a little bit what I, what I, how I try to go about things, okay? And um, of course, you know, um, this rings a bell as well with many uh, regional political parties. So it's about, you know, um, the employees have helped you to build the business. Um, and at the same time, um, we can't ignore that there is a need for capital, there's a need for investment, whatever model we opt for, um, there's still not enough on the table. There's enough for startups and there's enough for certain types of activity, um, but there's probably not um, enough, you know, as we move forward for industrial activities, even though I've worked with many of them to, to get to sustainability. And, you know, we, we, you probably realize that furniture manufacturing is a little bit of a a dirty industry, although it's cleaned up its act, uh, you know, quite substantially over the last number of years. And um, the idea is to build on that now and, um, you know, move it out to other manufacturing because I realize, you know, in furniture, I just haven't got enough cases. But if I can move it out to other manufacturing um, sector activities and then to try and um, analyze. The, the, my goal is to, to build up with 100 SMEs. I've got about 30 already uh, on the furniture side where I can break it down. So this is a bit more long term. I'm going to look at the financial aspects, but I think more and more the non-financial aspects are also important to the survival. What some of you have mentioned in your in your presentations about you know, um, demutualization and as we grow, um, you know, there's, is there a fair share for everybody? And that, that comes up across the board in all countries. Um, but also, are we doing enough 
um, to, to, you know, to retain and to recruit jobs. And that, that is really um, key for me. So that's a, a next step building on my, you know, that, that, it, that initial research that I carried out. And then um, you've got my um, contact details at the end there. So you've got my business school. So I'm a little bit different because I'm, I'm sh I've split my life between France and Belgium. Okay, so that's where you've got different addresses, and you've got my uh, my uh, LinkedIn uh, connection as well. So I hope I haven't you know overwhelmed you with lots of information and and uh, so on and so forth. I've tried to keep it as, as short and sweet as possible. And um, yeah, if um, anybody's got any questions or, 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 or comments, then um, yeah, fire away. Thank you ever so much, Carl. You've um, you're, you're brought us back on time as well. So well yeah. done. That's brilliant. <laughs> um, so we've got applause, but also Rory, did you have your hand up? Uh, I do have a question, but I'm happy to wait until others have... have uh... So, Richard. Uh, Richard, Richard's got a question as well. So, Richard, then Rory. Richard. Or perhaps Rory, then Richard. Well. If sabotaged, yeah. <laughs> he was. Oh, is Richard gone? I, I, I he doesn't Maybe seem to be responding. Mute. Maybe he's on mute. I don't know. Just yeah, Richard, Richard, you're on mute if you're talking. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Sorry, <laughs> yes. my tech, my tech decided to stop working. This is partly a question for Carl. Oh, oh you've gone. You've been sabotaged as well, Richard. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Um, Richard, should we take Rory's question while you're sorting your tech um, out? Yeah. Uh, the the slide that compared the. The performance. I mean, I know it's only three cases, but yeah, um, it's 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 over ten years now. But the first paper I published, um, I had a sample of ten employee-owned businesses, half of which were icon worker co-ops, and the other half yeah. were not. And I found much faster, but also much more volatile growth in those that were not icon co-ops. And your your French example seemed to be you know, much more modest in its its figures than the other two. And I wondered if you felt on the basis of your experience that you, you sacrifice stable growth for volatile growth um, when you're choosing between different legal approaches to employee ownership. Um, yeah, all I can say about this particular case, Rory, um, is that they wanted to be very, very careful. And maybe, again, that's that's in the culture. They didn't want to you know, uh, run before they could walk. And it was a, a huge learning curve for all of them because I was I was involved in in the transition itself. And I think that's mm. they said um, they said to me, let's let's keep it low key. We're not bothered. We'll go slowly but surely. And, and now whether that's just that was over in the in, in the western part of France. So that could be a little bit cultural. You know, we're not talking about Paris or anything like that. Um, that could be the furniture industry itself, but I, I know a lot of people who were, you can see the examples of the other case. So I'm, I'm thinking that it's just the, the culture of the, the management team and the, and the employees that came in probably. Yeah. 